In this beginner's guide on how to mix down in Ableton, I'll be covering common practices and things to consider while mixing down and getting your song sounding more balanced and slapping harder than ever. Hi, my name's Akito, London-based DJ and producer. This tutorial is a guide towards the basics of mixing down and things to consider throughout the process of creating cohesive, balanced bigger mixes that translate across more speaker systems and ready for the mastering house. My hope is after watching this video, you'll become more familiar by gaining basic knowledge on some of the tools and methods presented to venture out, experiment and refine your own mix down techniques. So make sure to stick about until the end and see what could help you get your music sounding even better. In this tutorial, we'll be using Ableton stock plugins to make it accessible to as many people as possible. I'll also leave a list of third party plugins I highly suggest checking out in the description for you. First up, we're going to start with equalization, EQ. This device will allow you to manipulate a sound by cutting unwanted frequencies and boosting those you want more of, allowing you to create a better balance of the elements in your mix down. I'll usually start with the EQ in my signal chain as I want to remove any frequencies I don't want before processing the sound any further. In these EQ examples, we'll be using Ableton's EQ8. First, we have finding and removing unpleasant frequencies. The easiest way to find unpleasant frequencies is to sweep through your sounds as they play. Simply boost one of the points and tighten the cue. Once you find a frequency you don't like, stop and drop the gain to cut the frequency out. And number two, giving sound space. If you have sounds that are in a similar frequency range competing against each other, or you want a sound to be more prominent in a specific frequency, you can prioritize your sounds by carving out space in the other. Let's expand the view of the EQ8. If we hover over the largest peak, the fundamental frequency, it will tell us the musical note, its octave and its frequency. We can now use this information to cut out that frequency from another sound. Here we'll be using the fundamental frequency of the snare and reduce it on the EQ of our synth sound, giving the snare more room. We can use the Q feature to adjust the width of the surrounding frequencies that will be affected and then we can use the gain to determine how many dB we would like to subtract or add to our chosen frequency. As you can hear, the difference isn't huge. As a lot of decisions you'll make while mixing down, it's the stacking up of subtleties and attention to detail that could make or break a mix. Number three, clearing space for your bass. For a clear, defined bass, a simple high pass filter can cut out any unnecessary low end frequencies from sounds that could potentially interfere with your bass elements. So keep in consideration the frequencies the kick drum, sub bass, 808s, etc. occupy and clear space for them from the other elements of your song. Here are some examples with the high pass EQ and without the high pass EQ. When the EQ is bypassed, the mix is slightly more muddy in the bottom end and the bass less defined. Tuning your drums can also help if you're experiencing frequency clashes. It can also make them sound more musical, especially tuned to the key of your song. I've covered this in a previous video, I'll link it in the end card and description for you. 
Compression. Compression is the process of reducing an audio signal's dynamic range, pushing the loudest and quietest parts together, attenuating the peaks and boosting the quiet parts to give you an overall more consistent volume. This is a huge part of the mixing down process, allowing your sounds to cut through whether they are positioned dead on or playing hide and seek in the background. Compression can be applied lightly for a more natural transparent sound or pushed to the extreme for something more brash and abrasive. It can also be applied to group channels, gluing your sounds together for a more cohesive listening experience. Different compressors will achieve different results results too. Some will sound more rich and musical while others can be cold or cleaner. It's worth trying the ones you can get your hands on to see what works best for your sound and occasion. Let's break down some of the key features of Ableton's compressor. Ratio. The compression ratio determines how much gain reduction the compressor will apply when the input signal passes the threshold level. By default, the Ableton compression ratio is set to two to one. That means for every two decibels the input signal goes over the threshold, the compressor will boost the output volume of your signal by one decibel. So let's say you set your ratio to four to one. Every four dB over the threshold will be increased by one dB. Here are some ratio settings. One to one. A one to one ratio will equal no compression. Whereas two to one, three to one ratio will apply a light to moderate compression. Four to one is a medium compression, eight to one, 10 to one, and above is a strong to heavy compression. 20 to one to infinity to one, the compressor will begin to act as a limiter, preventing almost any additional gain for your audio, which can be useful to tame any strong peaks. It's definitely worth experimenting with your ratio settings to see what is suitable, allowing your sounds to cut through and giving the elements enough presence without overpowering your mix. It is also very important to adjust the next feature at the same time, the compressor's threshold. The threshold sets how loud the input signal has to be before the compression is applied. Threshold and ratio work hand in hand, so make sure to adjust them together and see how they affect the sound. For more transparent compression, apply gently, only allowing a dB or two past the threshold. Push more input signal through the threshold for a more apparent stronger compression effect and adjust until it sits well with you and your mix down. Attack and release. The attack setting determines how quickly the compressor gets into action once the input signal reaches the threshold. While the release setting specifies how long it will take for the gain reduction to reset, using the compressor's attack and release can help to shape the transients of your signal, making your sound more fierce and snappy, or even slower and less intrusive. It's all down to how you set it up. Here is the drum loop from earlier. I'll play it first with a light compression, a medium compression, and finally with heavy compression. The compressor will be applied to the group channel in these examples, not on individual sounds. And next up we have sidechain compression. Sidechain compression is a compression that is affected by an external source or input volume going into a compressor. In this example, I'll be using a 4-4 kick pattern and feeding it into the compressor of my synth track. As it is playing, I will adjust the threshold and release times to demonstrate what effect it can achieve. To set this up, I'll add a compressor to my synth sound. I will then activate the sidechain input on it Using the box below, I will then select my input source, which will be the kick for this example. Here's what it sounds like with the sidechain compression on. You can also mute the sound sending the signal to your sidechain compression, creating a ducking and rising volume effect. Sidechain compression can be useful for layering sounds or giving extra space and impact to specific elements in your mix down. 
We will also cover parallel compression in the later part of this video. It's a simple and effective way of beefing up your sounds in little to no time. So stick about for that. Next up, we have stereo imaging. Stereo imaging refers to the aspect of sound recording and reproduction of stereophonic sound concerning the perceived spatial locations of the sound source, both laterally and in depth. And before we move forward again, here are the definitions of mono and stereo sound. Mono, also referred to as monaural or monophonic sound, is a single channel of audio. Stereophonic sound, more commonly known as stereo, is the reproduction of sound using two or more independent channels of audio. Now we know what defines a mono or stereo signal, we'll move on to panning. Panning is the distribution of a mono or stereo signal in a stereo or multi-channel sound field. More simply put, panning will allow you to position sounds whether they are mono or stereo signal within the stereo field of your composition giving your sound space and your track a wider stereo image. The more prominent elements commonly stay in the front and center of a mix, while the other elements tend to get quieter and descend to the back as they are positioned further left or right in the mix. In the next example, I'll play a four bar drum loop with and without panning. As some of the elements go further left or right, giving them their own space, the volume of these sounds can also be brought down and pushed back into the mix. Mono. mono. Kick and bass sounds are typically mono, especially in the lower bassier frequencies. Sitting bang in the middle of the mix gives them equal energy through both speakers. If you have a bass or kick drum with stereo information you wish to remain in the higher frequencies while keeping the bass in mono, this feature and utility is very handy. Simply load a utility device onto the sound and activate bass mono. You can now adjust the frequency when the sound will become stereo. You can also hit the headphone button to solo and have a listen to what frequency works best. The utility is extremely handy too working with stereo sounds, as you can alter a sound's wideness by adjusting the width knob, either making your signal occupy less space in the stereo field or bumping up the width to take up more space. Also to the right is the balance knob which will allow you to pan and position your sounds within the stereo field. And a quick bonus tip, a lot of engineers recommend mixing in mono as you can quickly spot issues with conflicting frequencies, phasing and make better EQ and leveling decisions as mono narrows down the focus. You can give this a go by sticking a utility on your master channel and enabling the mono button. A quick way of switching between mono and stereo as you are mixing. Saturation. Saturation introduces subtle harmonic distortion gently boosting multiple harmonic frequencies of the fundamental frequency of your sound without altering its character extremes like most distortion plugins, resulting in a warm, pleasant sound that is heavily associated with the sonic qualities of analog outboard gear. Saturation, when applied well, can bring a richness to your mixdowns, giving them a more musical sound. There are many plugins on the market now that emulate the qualities and nuances of running your music through a signal chain of transistors, valves, tapes and tubes. The best sounding emulations I've heard so far are by Universal Audio. They have a huge range of VSTs based on some of the most prolific studio equipment to date, but they also come at quite a high price point. Alternative plugins include Soundtoys Decapitator, Excellence RC20, FabFilters Saturn 2, Blackbox HG2, and Tape Simulation VST Saturn, and Waves J37 to name a few. I'll leave a full list in the description for you. In this example, we'll be going to Mike Dean's go-to saturation plugin. Ableton's own saturator device. We'll demonstrate the saturator on an 808 drum. Saturation and distortion are commonly used on 808s to boost their upper harmonics, making them audible on weaker speakers such as a smartphone or earphones. Here's the 808 with the saturator active and the saturator bypassed. Here is the saturator applied and bypassed the drum loop from earlier. Effects. 
In this section, I'll quickly run through some additional effects you can apply in your mixes. I'll also add them to the percussion loop of our drum loop example. Reverb. Reverberation or reverb is applied to your audio signal to simulate the sound in a space reflecting off surfaces and back to you and your listener. This can add extra depth and blend your sound smoother into your mix. Delay. The delay effect repeats the input signal at a controlled timing, creating an echo effect. Here is a quick example. Chorus. The chorus effect duplicates your input signal multiple times, shifting its pitch and timbre and playing it back slightly delayed from the source audio. Distortion. Distortion and overdrive can introduce extra grit and growl to your sound. Flanger. Flangers are quite close to the chorus effect function and sound wise, copying the input signal to delay and modulate it while it plays alongside the original. Phaser. Similar to both the chorus and flanger, the phaser will copy the input signal but won't delay it this time. Instead it will create a phase shift around a specific frequency. And next up we have return tracks. By default, Ableton's return tracks come loaded with reverb on A and delay on B. These can be changed and swapped out, of course. You can also add additional return tracks by hitting Command, Alt and T for my Apple users and Control, Alt and T for Windows gang. The return tracks can be super useful by allowing you to send the signal from a track to be processed without having to load up multiple instances of a plugin, which will save you CPU on your machine as well as create a consistent sound if you choose to send multiple tracks. To send the signal from a track and feed it into the return track, simply drag the corresponding knob upwards on your channel, adjusting it to your preference. When using the sends, I personally add an EQ with a high pass filter before the main plugin, so only sounds over a certain frequency are affected. This will keep the more bass heavy elements clean and avoid interference. You can also carve out any other frequency band or boost any you want more of. Couple bonus tips. From time to time, I'll use a utility in my send tracks, adjusting the width and the pan, and getting the send track to sit where I feel is fitting in the mix. I'll also use sidechain compression every so often on my return tracks to allow my kicks to penetrate the effects, adjusting the release to give them enough time and space to shine. You could potentially do this with any sound in your session. It's worth experimenting to see what works best if you wish to try this technique. And next, as promised earlier, parallel compression. Parallel compression is the process of mixing a fairly dry, clean signal alongside a heavily processed version. It's a quick and easy solution to beefing up your sounds. We'll start by creating a new return track, hitting Command, Alt and T simultaneously. Let's add Ableton's compressor to it and dial in some extreme settings. Change how much of the return track signal you want by either adjusting the return track input of the track 
or you can use the track volume slider of the return track or use a mixture of both. Sending individual drums to your return tracks. Also, if you prefer to send out your drums individually to your return track rather than as a group, go into your drum rack device, then activate the chain list. The chain list will then pop up to the right of the device. Make sure to activate the input output button labeled IO and the return track labeled R. Once activated, right click the area that says drop devices here and create a return chain. You will see a drop down on the furthest right of the return chain. Click it and select the return track you wish to send signal to. Now when you expand the channels of your drum rack, you will see sends for each individual sound, giving you extra maneuverability and precision while processing your drums. There is also an additional volume slider in the drum rack to adjust the volume of your return signal. Automation. Automation allows you to program in adjustments from volume fades, the panning of a sound, how much input you want to send to a return track, the parameters of a synth and plenty, plenty, plenty more. I'll go through some simple examples with you. Fade out using volume automation. Here I will be creating a fade out using volume automation on the drum loop. To show my automation options, I will hit A. Some options will now appear on my tracks. Under the mixer drop down on my drum loop track, I'll select the track volume. Now I can create the points of a volume fade out by double clicking points onto the automation line. I'll then drag it down where I want the music to fade into silence. If I want to adjust the volume curve to make it steeper to a quicker final descend or look like a skate ramp, I'll hold down Alt and click a point in the middle of the line. Now I can adjust it up or down. Panning automation. In this example, I'll be panning a shaker left to right. I do this often with my percussion sounds as I like them to dance around the track, giving them motion and a sense of playfulness. First, I'll go to the drop down and select track panning. Now I'll create some points on my automation line. I want the first hit of the shaker to start on the left and the second shaker to the right. So I'll drag my line down for the first and drag the second point upward. If you feel the sounds are too far in the stereo field, you can always bring the points back closer to the center. Auto filter. In this example, I'll show you how to automate Ableton's auto filter frequency setting. This can work well introducing elements into your composition or fading them out without using volume. First, we will load up Ableton's auto filter on our desired track. Now we will select the auto filter on the top drop down then frequency on the bottom drop down. Now we can draw in the automation line. I'll set the frequency all the way down and get it to open up at the end of the loop. Automating signal to send tracks. Another thing I do quite often is automate the inputs to send tracks. Right click the send track knob you wish to send signal to and hit show automation. It's a quick and simple way to add variation to a track as it plays out and keep the ears interested. Now we have some of the basics of automation covered, let's move on to grouping tracks. Grouping tracks or even grouping groups of similar tracks and then lightly processing them again can help glue the sounds together and potentially gain a bit more volume out of your mix down. I'd advise not to push these too hard though as you may begin to lose dynamic range if you go too hard on the processing. To group tracks or to group groups, select the ones that you'd like together and hit Command and G and begin to process them as you would. And next, we have referencing. 
I believe referencing your mixes against existing music is one of the most effective and quickest ways of achieving great sounding mix downs. It can be off putting at first, making comparisons to some of your favourite tracks, but you're doing this to create a better balance in your own tracks by taking audible pointers. I suggest creating a collection of music you love the mix down qualities of. It could be the tonal balance of a track, the way the bass slaps in a dance, the smooth, silky saturation, the way the shaker cuts through. It could be absolutely anything. Selecting tracks that share similarities to your sound or genre will help loads too. Also keep into consideration that master tracks will most likely be a lot louder than your mix down. You can compensate by dropping the volume down if you import references into your project file. Visual, Visual referencing. referencing. You can also load up a spectrum device to see what frequencies your references are hitting and at what volume. This can be a great visual aid and show what frequency bands could be boosted or turned down for better balance in your own mix downs. Test your mixes. On as many devices as possible. The aim for most mix engineers that I know is to create mixes that translate to as many audio outputs as possible. From top of the range line array systems, the old neglected hi-fi collecting dust in the corner to a pair of tiny airpods your mate keeps losing. The best way to see if your music does that, of course, is to run it through as many speakers and headphone systems you have access to. Take notes, amend and test again, refine as you go. Export settings. And once you have your mix sound in 1010, you will want to bounce it out as a stereo file or as groups if you choose a stem mastering option. Most but not all mastering houses request the client to send uncompressed audio files at a minimal 24 bit 48 kilohertz. So it's better to set your in and out sample rate and your preferences to 48 kilohertz or above before making any music to reach these requirements, if possible to avoid any issues at the export stage. In terms of headroom, at least 3 to 6 dB of headroom is commonly requested, but as long as the signal is not clipping it is fine, the engineer can turn it down on their side if need be. You should also bypass any processing you have on the mastering output unless you believe it is 100% necessary. This will allow the mastering engineer to work their magic and give them the manoeuvrability to bring out the best in your mix down. I hope you've enjoyed the video on the basics of mixing down and gained some value out of it. Mixing for me is a particularly tricky side of the music making process and I'm learning as I go. So if you don't see results immediately, please be patient and do research beyond this video. There's always a lot to learn and plenty of experimenting to be done. I wish you happy mixing and ultimately better mixes and please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. It would be greatly appreciated as I'd like to grow it into a full time thing and make plenty more videos for you. I'll also leave some videos in the end card that may be handy. Until next time, stay safe, much love.